Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Leo Meyer and my wonderful associate, Dolly Curtis. And we're here tonight with our latest edition of Backstage Buzz, giving our audience an inside view of things going on in the entertainment world. But tonight we have a wonderful lady, and uh, I'd like the world to hear from our guest tonight, Mrs. Lebrain Warren. Mrs. Warren is a very famous paranormal investigator. And Lorraine, it's wonderful to be here tonight and chat with you. I love the way you two met. <laughs> Tell everybody how you met recently. Well, it was at a, a lecture in Beardsley Park. It was a lecture on paranormal activities. And so it was in October, I'm sure, because Lorraine's so much Right in around meetings. Halloween, exactly. Right around October. She's always That's every right. night somewhere. And uh, Lorraine sort of picked me out of the audience <laughs> over and said, the aura is getting in my way. <laughs> Coming out of you, that aura, which yeah. I'm sure you give off. Yeah, he has a beautiful aura. I'm sure, because yeah. he's so out yeah, lively. Yeah, he's, got, he's and, going in so many directions. He is. And it's beautiful. Yeah. So you well, saw it right yes. away. They, 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 it said that people who are really true psychics really do emanate, emanate, and, and have, have, but no, the, they can see it. They see the colors. The, the Is aura. it colors? Lorraine? Yes, it's colors. It's not so much the colors as the clarity of the colors that is important, but it would be the clarity that would define. I couldn't tell he was a very beautiful person. Hmm, so you went over and talked to him. So anyhow, he just couldn't get well, over that. Well, he's uh, well, very I'm interested. Well, it was quite quite informal. It was quite spontaneous that uh, I came out with it in front of everybody. We, we chatted after yes, the Yes, and that's how we got together for tonight. Right. Uh, Leo called me and said, I met Lorraine Warren. Ooh. I said, I've attended many of her wonderful lectures. I'm convinced that any entertainer or anyone in, in the world of entertainment is communicating on an extrasensory level. Mm -hmm. And I think there are certain aspects of your work that are very pertinent to being a, a live en entertainer, a singer, or an actor. Mm -hmm. It's all in communication. It's, it's like circus trainers who work with animals. There's a communication that we don't, we can't oh, touch, yeah. but it's there. Oh, yeah. Even my communication with my pet, it's a very soothing type of thing to have this many pets and this much diversity. I have three roosters and a hen. I have twin roosters. And then I have Einstein and Miss Hannah. They're like husband and wife. I rescued Einstein and Hannah just showed up and she sat on an egg that he fertilized and they had twin roosters. And as far as we know, and as far as I've been told, they are the only twin roosters that are known. Really? Yeah. So are they outside in the summer and come in in the winter or are they out? They have to be in they have to be in, in the winter uh, because of their cones. And the roosters they don't have um, they don't have mate. They don't have females with them. So there's no way to keep them warm. So they have to come in for the winter time. Now, now, when you do your your normal line of work, which is your paranormal investigations, mm -hmm. are animals ever utilized in tracing of, say, a murder, or or do no. animals enter into into the pictures? I, no, not these animals. Maybe maybe dogs, rescue dogs, and things like that. But I don't have a rescue dog. The last dog that I had, I lost just right right after Ed. With rescue dogs, you can work with right. rescue dogs, but I don't own a rescue dog. But yes, they have a certain amount of sensitivity. And they're so attached, of course, to their to their trainer or their owner. And, their, uh, yeah, how how you treat them is very very important. Like how seeing, animals are like treated. a seeing eye dog, I should yes. think. Uh, would almost have a psychic t connection to, to its I I its believe master. they do, Leo. I really believe that. I believe that these um, animals that are used for people that are blind, mm -hmm. I do believe that they have a certain psychic connection with each it's other. Like, so we were talking before we went on, on the air about veterinarians and treating an animal, and the animals seem to sense someone oh, yes. who is able to, to care for them. And I had a great uncle who was a veterinarian for the circus and oh. would go into the, to treat an, an injured animal in a cage, a wild animal, a lion or a tiger or something, and felt perfectly at ease. And, and uh, obviously, the animal sensed that I have this person I have a sense. 
of wanting to be with big animals, to be able to feel them, to be able to touch them. I would just love to do that. Well, I, I, I watch my vet take care of my cat, and we mm -hmm. could all learn something from this. We can. Well, when we they can. had that terrible tsunami, the animals all knew, yes. right? So they all moved up higher. Right. They the knew animals. ahead. Yeah, but yeah. now, they felt that. is that a godly instinct? Maybe that is a godly instinct, because you have to realize God created all these animals. And it comes so from somewhere. It comes from somewhere. Well, they all knew ahead, so people need to study that, because they all moved to higher ground, right. and they did they not did. die in that tsunami. That's amazing what you just spoke about. I, I read that and I could definitely relate to and that. In Katrina, the animals took a real hardship, though. Oh, yes, they do. That was horrendous watching yeah. what happened. Are yeah. there ghosts of animals? Are there? Yes. Yes, there are. Our German Shepherd, very high intellect, he appeared to us about two months after he had passed. And my husband had gone out to put the trash in the garbage cans outside of the house and we had company and he just came back to the door very quietly he says come here I want to show you something and we went out and there was Major sitting on top of his house he was a Von Turcott dog and the other thing was that he had been a war dog we had a flat top dog house made for him so he could sit on the top of that and when Ed wanted to, you know, bring him in, like when it was getting dark and he would come in, he would go, lie Mrs. down. Warren is pointing, by the way. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and he, then he would unleash his collar and he would run into the house. When we watched him, that was, it was a very beautiful experience. But then the following day, we couldn't wait to get home to see if he would appear again, and the doghouse was gone. The whole doghouse? The whole doghouse. It was the last night the doghouse would be there. How did that dog know that? And oh, wow. Ed had bought me two little puppies, two little twin female puppies, because we just were not getting over the death of that dog. And a, an elderly man down the road, he came and took that doghouse and made two little doghouses out of it. Not that they could stay outside or anything, but just so they had their own little houses. But that was the last night that that house would be there. Really? You just disappear. Oh, we're hearing oh, from the... Yes, we're hearing from Einstein. One of the <laughs> Einstein. That was nice, honey. He was singing a little. Yes. Well, but one of the reasons, of course, now we're, we're, we're discussing tonight uh, um, Mrs. Warren's work, which is with paranormal, and often often she's, she's labeled a ghostbuster, and uh, I'm kind of interested about ghosts in the theaters. And oh, it's, and many it's, theaters. I know, many theaters. There are many theaters yeah. that claim to have uh, all kinds of spirits in them. Oh, and that's, yes. that's a subject I thought we could really delve into a little bit tonight. Oh, um, yes. In England, I, I, well, I, I, I just come back from Ireland, but um, I didn't do any investigating in theaters in Ireland, but I did investigating homes. And um, but in England, oh my goodness! I know there's a fam there are famous ghosts in, at uh, the Drury Lane. The, uh, I was in the Drury, Drury Lane, and I did see it was it was almost like a reenactment of of figures that were there from probably a play or like that. It was beautiful. And it was so beautiful. You mean with costumes? With, with costumes, costumes but you weren't seeing them in their full color. They were kind of faded. But And then to see them all like that, you thought, oh, if I could only just shine a light on all of you, I could really see you so much better. And I could see that. Oh, yes, I seen it quite a bit in the Drury Lane Theater. 
a number of years Have ago. Have you been to the Sterling Theater in Derby where they, uh, my friend Rich DiCarlo says he, you know, he has the key. It's the and, opera house. Uh, the oh, so I would like to opera. get in that opera house. Oh, we'd be happy to. He invited us to come today and do the interview there, but we thought oh. we would like to do it as we thought we would try to go over. If you would like to, we could arrange that. I, uh, yeah, I would like to because up in um, that Winstead, oh, my God, the opera house... I read you know that in Thomaston? No. Thomaston. Oh, yes, there's a They claim there's a... There was a, a man. Rose, yes. A ghost there. And, yes. and my goodness, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm speaking at this time. And I was kind of ending what I was talking about. And one of these men who had brought me in came up with this big bouquet of roses. And I looked up, and here's this man... Up in the back, and he waved <laughs> in that theater. Do they know who who the man was? The, they the did know. They did know who he was, and we were called back there um, to lecture, and not in that not in that particular place, but in another place there in Thomaston. We were called back, and uh, they had done so much research on it and even told the name. I don't recall the name, but they told me the name of the man that I was able to, to, to see there. And he was kind of like a, a care, care person oh. there. You know, he had, he had duties and responsibilities, and he still carries these responsibilities on in a way. Yeah. At the, uh, the uh, opera house, the Sterling Opera House, supposedly, there's a, a woman uh, who is always seen s- seated in the same seat up in the balcony, uh, in, dressed in antique clothing, and the ghost. Oh, of how the, beautiful! The woman. Oh, yeah. this friend of ours said he's photographed her. Oh, Not, he no, did. he he didn't know that he was photographing her, mm-hmm. but he saw some lights uh, moving or some orbs, and then he didn't tell anybody for two years because he thought people would think he was, you know, foolish. And then this year, somebody came there to do a a television show. Right, there was an Italian tenor. Oh, I saw that. It was an uh, advertise a commercial. Named Roberto LaRussi, who stopped by the opera house to film a promotional video for the hospital. Oh, wow. And he took some pictures and the same image of the woman show, showed up in, in the photo. The person, the, the crew that came to film that commercial with that opera mm-hmm. singer, so a Connecticut resident to the opera, they had the same image of the same woman right, on same. their... How beautiful. So they showed it to Rich DiCarlo, and then he realized that was the same images that he had on his pictures from two years ago. Oh, my. Yeah, very oh, interesting. Wow. That is very well, interesting. Well, uh, Liza Minnelli claims to have, have seen... Uh, the ghost of Judy Garland at mm-hmm. the Palace Theater in New York. Where yes, they built, I read that. They built a special door that Judy had to use to get into the through the theater her act years back, and uh, Manelli claims to have seen hmm. Garland's image standing. Now, Leo, what about there. the fact that in the theater they always leave a light on? That's one of the reasons. It's called the ghost light. Yeah, oh. yeah. Um, I, I, at times we, we suggest that to people in hauntings. Leave a, a single, light on. A Le- yes, light. and that's to, to keep the, the ghost can see, or is that no, so you no. can see? No, that's that's so. <laughs> so you don't fall into the orchestra. That's what I mean. Yeah. Is that what it's for? <laughs> well, well, in in the case of the from the phenomena standpoint, you know, very seldom will they show themselves in a place that's illuminated with some sort of light, artificial or otherwise. The ghost of David Belasco has been seen in the Belasco Theater, and and he he was seen many times supposedly as dressed in a sort of a clergy outfit. He always wore mm-hmm. a, a high white collar. And, Did he and play a, that part a lot? No, no. But he he always dressed like a clergyman. There was a famous ghost in the New Amsterdam Theater, mm-hmm. and that it's theater, of course, was was heavily renovated. But originally, there was a rooftop theater in that in that building above the New Amsterdam Theater was a famous was a rooftop? rooftop theater, and 
the fire department uh, insisted that it be no longer used, so it was it was abandoned because the escape route was not adequate. Mm-hmm. And so it used it a little bit as a rehearsal hall, and then for years it wasn't used at all. Supposedly, it was a famous, famous, famous showgirl who kept appearing in full feathers and jewels, and, and, and th- this this apparition. Uh, uh, kept appearing since the Disney company went in and renovated that whole yes. theater they, they redeveloped that upper area I don't know whether the apparitions have been still appearing there or not but of course the theater was heavily heavily redecorated and all, all mm-hmm. renovated and they converted that area into offices and, mm-hmm. uh, so it would be interesting to find out Yes, if, if there's still definitely be interesting to find still out. Still some spirits do, there. Do the, Lorraine, do these uh, spirits, apparitions are here because of some unhappiness? Um, like with the white lady in, in the East, and you always say she's unfinished, unfinished business. business. Is unfinished. that true then with yes. as Leo's talking about these ghosts in the theaters? Is it some unhappy? Well, if that was a happy time for them. And so, yes, and they're reliving that. They're reliving these things over and over again. But is it true that many the ghosts supposedly are, are the result of violent death? Well, it, 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 that also is true, yes. But now it, every spirit that shows itself is, had not met a violent death. Uh-huh. No, definitely not. Didn't reach a violent death. But, um, I mean, my own husband came back to me and... Um, that was that was very beautiful. I normally don't talk about that, but he did, and um, it was it was wonderful for me. So people have to be more sensitive to it because maybe other uh, spirits try to reach people, but they're not sensitive to no, it, so they, they don't. Can't, no, they can't perceive it. Mm-hmm. You know, no, that's very very true. Yes. So they don't know what's happening, people, because they're not open to it or they're not sensitive they're to not it. They're not sensitive to it or open to it. I mean, it might prove too frightening to them. So they don't want to acknowledge anything being there. So like with Ed, you, you knew, I mean, because they may not come back in the form or that they no. were when you last saw them, right? No. Well, I'll, I'll explain one time that, that he did this to me. Um I was sitting right out here on my back deck, and it was the fall of the year. It was soon after he had passed, and I was looking out past the gazebo. There's a big gazebo out there, and then there's the drop-off, and the water below is part of the reservoir, and then that kind of a low mountain that's behind that. And I could see the leaves changing, and I said, Honey, I wonder if you can see those leaves changing where you are. I wonder if you're able to perceive that. I know how you love the fall of the year. And with that, the phone rang. And it was a script writer from uh, Warner Brothers who had written a script on our life. And he said, he was crying, and he said, Lorraine, I can't tell you how I feel about Ed's passing. He said, it's just so upsetting to me. He said, for a man who was so brilliant where his work was concerned, he had such a sense of humor. This is how I answered him. I didn't answer him. I said to him, Teddy, I always knew when Ed was at peace and Ed was happy if I heard him whistle. And I said, wherever he would be, I had to go and look and smile, but I wouldn't say anything, but it did my heart good. So the next morning was his birthday. He died just two weeks before his birthday. And I went to Mass and Communion for him. Then I went to his gravesite, and I said to him, Honey, I know what we'd be doing if you were here. I said, You would wake up first. You would say, Get up. Get dressed. We're going to our favorite place for breakfast, and it's my treat. So I said to him, Honey, we're going to our favorite place for breakfast today, and it's my treat. So we went. I went to the Bluebird. Oh, is that your favorite place? That's our favorite okay. place in Easton. And um, I walked in, 
and there was a new little waitress, and she sat me down. I asked for one particular table, and I said, table for two. And um, when she came to take my order, I said, it'll only be me eating. I said, if my husband were here, this is where we'd be celebrating his birthday for the morning. I says, but I lost him two weeks ago. And she says, oh, how sad. And she walked in the other dining room. So this woman that was in the kitchen looked through that little window that's there. And she came out, are you Mrs. Warren? I said, yes. And she said, um, we have a problem here. I said, a problem? I didn't know of any problems here. And she said, uh, she says, I said, I said, what kind of a problem? Um, she said, it just started today. I says, what time today? She says, five o'clock this morning. I says, what happened at five o'clock this morning? And she said, when the dishwasher got here, he called and said he was terrified and he was going home. And I said, why? He says, because I heard whistling. So I said, may I speak to that man? And I can read auras, as you know. I said, tell me, sir, tell me exactly what you heard and what time you heard it. He says, when I came in, 5 o'clock this morning, I heard a real man whistle twice, and I was terrified and I was going home. That's how Ed let wow. me know he was at peace yeah. and that he was happy. And that was one of the most beautiful things to happen because of the fact I didn't know if I could continue my work. I knew my son-in-law would always be there to help me, but who was I to think that I could take on the role that was Ed and Lorraine Warren? So that gave me a green light See, I couldn't continue my university work if I couldn't research. I had no right to talk about things that happened before. So that, that was really a very, very beautiful thing to have happened. The connection of music is very interesting also. Yes. Uh, um, I have a, a, a friend who's a very renowned concert pianist. Mm -hmm. world famous who, who claims that he's now channeling Frederick Chopin really? yes and he's in the process of writing a book about it how beautiful and, uh, Chopin Chopin well the thing is you have to realize that the person himself is in the same line of talent right. mm -hmm. as that man that's right that's what would bring him to that right Leo? yeah that's Open him up to that. Yes. But um, I think it was Ed's way of knowing that he was at peace and he was happy. Yeah. But yeah. why did I say that to Teddy Tannenbaum? Why did I ever say that? I oh, that, why that he whistles when he's content. And yes. That, yeah. why, did, why did I even... But you saw that as your green light to go ahead with the work that you two had been working on for 40 years. You met in Bridgeport, from what I read. Yes. As youngsters, you were just youngsters. We were 16. So you were attracted to each other from the beginning. Oh, we were. Big love affair you two had. For 16-year-olds. I mean, right, I, from the I, beginning. He's, he's the only boy I've ever been I know, but with. your mom was never angry because you were seeing him from the beginning. You know, when you went, mm, Well, you were just a kid. All right, well, like, let me explain it to you this way then. What had happened was I was going to the movies with a group of girls from CYO at St. Charles in Bridgeport. And I was at Lawton Hall. And so they they wanted to go to the movies. And on the way there, uh, my parents said I could go to the movies with these girls. And on the way there, he, um, uh, the girls said to me, we want to introduce you to this boy. Now, I didn't want to say to them, I'm not interested in going out with boys. You know, I have an education. I have, you know... My life, my parents, my schooling, the church, these are the things that are important to me, not boys, are, to, are really important. I didn't want to say that to them. But what happened was that he, um, you know, when I met him, when, when we went in and I met him, and I looked at Ed, 
and they said that he was a lifeguard during the day and he was an usher in the theater at night. And I looked at him from the polished shoes to the crease in his pants to the white shirt and I thought, what a well-groomed young man you are. That is how I perceived him. Hmm, that's interesting because you were attracted to hear that because I know you always yourself are always so beautifully dressed and I've seen you so many times in the little schoolhouse in Monroe and you're always, even in the, when you're shopping, you always have that, you know, special, your hair has always got a bow in it and okay, beautiful you. outfit. So you were attracted to that so when you were 16 yes, and him. Exactly. And you married him shortly afterwards. Oh, no, I, I, I married him. He became a war hero when his right. ship went down and we were married on survivor's leave. But you were only 17 then. 18. Oh, 18. We, we oh, were 18, 18 years old by that. So most of our whole courtship was by mail. And the summer, the summer that, that we went together before he, see, I met him in June and he went in the military in September. He went on his 17th birthday into the, the Navy. He got us education when he came out. And um, so anyway, when this all happened, you know, we corresponded. But all during that summer, everything we did was with my parents and my brother and sister. Picnics and rides and Savin Rock and all those things. We're all ten together. We were all together. I, I know one night, one day, he had said to my parents, could um, I take Lorraine to the movies? And my father said, yes, but you can't drive her there. You're going to have to walk. Well, that was a different era, wasn't it, though? So then you were married for how many years? You were married from the time you were 18? 16, 62 and a half years. Yeah, I know. That's quite a romance, quite a love story yours was. Oh, yeah. We, we, I remember yeah. when you were taking care of him mm -hmm. the five years prior to his passing. Mm -hmm. And you were, taught, you were doing your lectures the whole time. Yes, Yes, definitely. Yes. Well, if someone has never heard one of Lorraine's lectures, they need to go. L Lorraine, tell me, when you first became aware of these psychic abilities, and were you a youngster at that time? Or Nine years this? old oh, in grammar time. school at Laurelton Hall, and I began seeing lights around people. And Didn't it frighten you? No. You know, I grew up in such a secure, loving way. I never experienced fright at a young age like that. I can never say I was frightened by it. And when I could see these lights around people, I thought everyone could see these lights. I thought everybody could see that. One day, leaving my French teacher, I said, Sister, your lights are so much brighter than Mother Superior's. That didn't fly. That definitely did not fly, and I was punished for that. Now, trying to share that, with my parents and my brother and sister. It seemed like it was painful that they didn't have the answer for me. And Mama would talk about the Irish people and things of that nature and how they might relate, but it wasn't that. When I could see that, how that was going, that nobody understood this, that everybody wasn't seeing what I was seeing, then I suppressed it, but it didn't go away. I began to see it around, around everything God created. I seen it around trees, around flowers, around animals, around birds, everything he created. And I thought, how beautiful. I wonder what that means. I really did not know what that meant until I was at UCLA. And when I was at UCLA and working with Dr. Thelma Moss and Dr. Johnson regarding Curlian photography, the Russian invented camera that photographs the human aura around everything God created, that I really truthfully felt vindicated. But I'll tell you a little more about my husband and our relationship. He was going to be walking home with us. I could see that that was coming into play. He knew these other girls. He knew all of them. But we were coming out of the theater, and there was, a, there was an air raid, 
this is wartime. This is 43. And um, so we had to wait for an all clear. And when that happened, he said, I'll buy all you girls a coat. I ordered an ice cream soda because I don't drink Coke and I don't drink Coke to this day. And he kidded me all my life that he knew I was a gold digger from the first night he met <laughs> because I ordered an ice cream soda when everybody else ordered a Coke. So now he walked home with us. He kind of walked backwards, so he was addressing all of us. And then we got to his home first. And when we got to his house, and when we got there, and he ran across the street, I didn't see that 142-pound athletic kid. I seen Ed as he looked the day I lost him. And I wrote in my diary, I'll spend the rest of my life with you. But you could see the future, you mean, on that? I, could... I knew I'd spend the rest of my life with him. Mm -hmm. And you did, yeah. And I did. Well, speaking of the rest of our life, we could spend the rest right, of our life right here tonight. This beautiful uh, little this, place here. This, this, uh, sweet. This, uh, unfortunately, our airtime is is Too has ticked, short. To, ticked away, and uh, we're going to have to say say good night. Lorraine Warren, famous paranormal investigator, Wonderful lecturer, lecturer, Intrigued. farmer, Intrigued. veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> this lovely lady has done it all, and you've been a, a wonderful guest. And thank you for inviting us into your home. Oh, you're and, more than and welcome. Sharing your and life's activity don't with miss us. Our lectures. <laughs> it's been a very special evening. Thank you so much. It was special for me too. Thank you very much. This is Leo Meyer and Dolly Curtis. This is saying good night for Backstage Buzz. 